Okay, so the next speaker is Timo Weigand, who will talk about EFT streams and quantum gravity bounds in F-theory. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, thanks a lot to the organizers for having me and for um, organizing this wonderful event. It's always great to be here. And um, I'd like to continue with the theme uh, where Luca left it and um, discuss um, certain aspects of these bounds from um, EFT strings now in F theory. I was a bit more optimistic or maybe naive about the date of uh, or month of appearance, but we'll see. And I'll also uh, comment on um, some uh, related earlier work with uh, Song Ju Lee and with Anthony Lacroix. So as we just learned um, from uh, Lucas' talk, one can establish general bounds on the rank of the gauge algebra in 4D n equal one supergravity theories, making use consistency of these EFT strings. And the rank is such that it bounds the rank of the gauge algebra, which, which speaks to the string in terms of certain axionic couplings to higher derivative sectors, which is something that is a priori purely gravitational and one might think has nothing to do with the gauge sector, but there seems to be such a relation between the gauge sector and the gravitational higher derivative couplings. In this talk, I'd like to um, focus on concrete realizations of these bottom-up bounds. So while this previous talk was bottom-up and did not make use of string theory per se, um, now I'd like to apply them and look at them in detail in the context of string theory, in the context of F theory to be precise for two reasons. First, I'd like to check some of the assumptions which entered the derivation um, in the bottom-up approach in a concrete calculable system. And second, I'd also like now to use a little bit more information that we have in concrete string theory examples in order to further sharpen the bound. And in particular, the outcome will be a novel sharpened bound on the rank of the gauge algebra in F theory which is of this type, I will discuss what it means, and it goes beyond what one knows and knew so far from geometry. Okay, so uh, the FT strings, as we learned, are those strings which are charged under the two form fields in the 4D n equal one supergravity, whose dual sections become weakly coupled in the limit induced by the back reaction of the string in four dimensions. Um, so we have certain chiral multiplets with a sexion and an axion. The axion is dual to the two form under which the EFT string is charged. And the back reaction of that string in four dimension implies a profile for the sexions of this type such that um, the uh, sexions go to large or infinite distance as was discussed in these papers. So um, in the limit induced by this back reaction, um, the instantons, which are dual to the string in the four-dimensional sense, become weakly coupled. And this is also one way how one can characterize the string via those instantons, which become weakly coupled in the corresponding limit. So let's now do this concretely for F-theory in the Keller moduli space. Um, this means I'm looking at compactification of F-theory on elliptic fourfold and the base B3. This is a sixth real dimensional space to four dimensions. The instantons in question, I'm going to focus on this sector because this is the most interesting one for us. The instantons are the three instantons on effective devices, so four cycles wrapping the base. And the EFT strings are the dual objects. So they come by wrapping a D3 brain on a curve C. This gives a string in four dimensions. And the curve is dual to the effective devices. Now, the set of curves dual to the set of effective devices is called the movable, co the movable curves, curves in the cone, um, in the movable cone. And um, the point of these movable curves is, as the name suggests, these are curves which are non-rigid. They can probe the entire base. So they live in a family that covers a dense open subset of B3. That's the definition. And therefore, it's kind of clear that these are the objects to look at in the context of quantum gravity because they can talk to everything in the bulk. And this is where gravity live, lives as opposed to strings which become strongly coupled in uh, FCFTs, uh, because these are only sensitive to certain gauge sets. And um, in fact, um, the characterization of this cone of movable curves in this Keller threefold of F theory um, will be um, one of the topics discussed um, by, my, by Max Wiesner. And uh, he'll also classify further the FT string limits um, that um, are induced by these objects. Okay, but this is not what we are going to discuss. We want to see how these strings interact or talk to the gauge sector. Which gauge sector? The gauge sector on seven brains, because we're doing F theory. So the seven brains also wrap four cycles on this base. 
and therefore also have a natural intersection with the curves wrapped by the three brains, which then give rise to the strings. And the fact that these curves of the EFG strings are movable has two important consequences for us. Namely, first, we can assume that this movable curve can be removed, can be moved away from all the seven brains. So technically, this means that it's not contained in the discriminant locus of the total. Discriminant locus is the um, totality of all devices which are wrapped by the seven brains, by the space between the seven brains. And if my curve happens to lie inside, I can just move it away because it's movable. So this means that these curves can be viewed as being transverse to the seven brains. And in fact, they intersect transversely, excuse me, at points. Oops. At points. And at these points, we have charged fermionic zero modes. And these are one of the two reasons why the strings will talk to the gauge cycle. And second, this is a technicality, but very important. Um, since the anti-canonical class in F theory is always effective, and the curves, the movable curves, are dual to the effective cone. This means that these curves, under consideration, have positive intersection or non-negative intersection with the anti-canonical class. This is something important for um, uh, for some of the uh, uh, computations that underlie what follows. Okay. So um, we'd now like to understand what are the possible modes, what is the possible theory on this string. This is a, um, um, that we get by wrapping. Um, the D3 brain on this curve. And this can, in fact, be done by reducing the original n equal four super young Mills theory of a single D3 brain on such a curve on the base of this elliptic vibration to R11 times C. And um, technically, this is a bit complicated because the exodilaton varies. So one has to do a topological twist and, in fact, also a topological reality twist, something that was pioneered by uh, Luca uh, a long time ago. And um, this computation in the present case. Um, was done in 2016, and it shows indeed that one gets a 2D 0,2 Welsh theory whose masses modes one finds by reducing the modes of the super angles theory, um, super, uh, super angles theory, um, namely uh, the gauge field, the six adjoint scalars of our D3 brain, and then the fermionic parts. So by doing this uh, twisted reduction, one gets masses modes on the world volume of the string. And we need to know which types of fields these are, because from there we will then deduce our bounds on the rank of the bulk gauge. So this is um, a busy slide. I apologize for this, but I wanted to put everything on one slide so, so, so you see it. So these are the types of fields that one gets. So first of all, one has chiral multiples. These contain a complex scalar and a um, right-moving fermion, and also Fermi multiples, which only contain left-moving fermions. Um, one has one universal chiral multiplet that comes from the universal motion of the string in four dimension. This is boring. And then one gets two types of chiral multiplets, which kind of um, describe the motion of the string on the internal space. And these are very interesting. First of all, we have those which, are, which qualify as deformation modes, so which literally correspond to the moduli, if you like, of the curve in, in the internal space or part of them. You see they are counted by uh, sections of the normal bundle to the curve in the base. And there's a second type of such chiral multiplets. We call them twisted Wilson lines um, because they come from reduction of the gauge field from, uh, from the superangulus theory, and they are counted um, by this more complicated fashion, uh, uh, exp uh, expression. Furthermore, we have Fermi multiplets, again, two types. Um, the first Fermi multiplets, uh, just left moving fermions, they are, in fact, obstructions to the deformation modes. They are given by H1 of the normal bundle. And a second type, which we interpret as obstructions to some of these twisted Wilson lines. And on top of this, so this is what one gets from the super young Mills theory. So two types of chiral multiplets and two types of Fermi multiplets that come together, as the color suggests. And then in addition, one has certain Fermi multiplets that come from three seven strings at the intersection of the D3 brain with the seven. And their number is given by this. And what I'd like to point out, and this is important, the difference of numbers of chiral multiplets minus numbers of Fermi multiplets of type one, this red guy, these red guys, their difference is just given by this topological number. And this is the number of unobstructed, um, of unobstructed geometric moduli of the curve inside the space D3. Whereas the difference of numbers of chiral multiplets of these, of the blue type, um, also given by topological in, uh, index, are conjectured by us to agree with the number of unobstructed twisting 
twisted Wilson modulo. So um, naively, one might think that only um, the Cairo multiplet give the moduli, but there will be obstructions because one has so little supersymmetry. And we claim that these are the correct numbers that count. This. Why is this important? This is important because these differences now enter the actual bounds on the rank. Namely, the rank, the claim is that the rank of a certain, of the gauge group of a certain seven brain, which interacts with uh, one of these strings, is bounded as follows. It's bounded by the number of charged Fermi multiplets plus two times the number of unobstructed modules. So the Fermi multiplets here, these are the three seven strings that are charged. They actually carry charge. And, and C minus an N, these are the effective um, moduli and twisted Wilson line moduli that can appear, appear. And these two sum up to precisely this number, which Luca showed before. Um, so um, these happen um, um, to precisely agree um, with um, a certain overlap that is sensitive to the higher derivative couplings um, um, of the bulk. Um, so if we, this formula was a general formula. So Luca just, uh, Flash the formula, but this can be derived in a bottom up fashion. But if we now specialize to the seven brains uh, uh, and the corresponding strings, we see where, where these um, uh, chiral multiples come from that enter, enter the game. We have these multiples of the first type and of the second type, and uh, they are counted by certain intersection numbers of the curve on which we wrap our D3 brain to get the string and, excuse me, and the anti canonical bundle. And if you sum them up, you get this expression. The total rank should be small of the, of the gauge group sector, uh, of the gauge group sector that couples to the string should be smaller than or equal times 12 times the intersection number of the curve wrapped by the string with the anti-canonical class minus two. And that's just the overlap of the curve wrapped by the string with the totality of all seven brains, i.e. the discriminant one. And this also uh, is the first consistency check. This, this matches also the above formula where the C tilde was this axonic um, coupling to the trace R squared terms, and this indeed matches uh, uh, precisely um, the number 12. Okay, so this is just applying the general bound now to F3. But in F3, we can, go, we can do more because we know what the nature of the various chiral fields that enter the bound are. And we claim that in fact, only um, chiral multiples of the second type of the blue type actually contribute to um, this rank because these are the only ones that can be charged under the gauge group on the seventh. And uh, more precisely, these chiral multiples of the first type, these are really geometric moduli of the curve wrapped by the D3 brain to give the string, and they cannot enjoy any gauged um, uh, shift symmetries under the, uh, with respect to the seven brain gauge. group. So they should not really appear um, in this formula here. Only the second type of moduli are, um, uh, can be moduli whose which can enjoy a shift symmetry, which can be gauged by the seven brain gauge group. Therefore, we propose that only they should actually enter this bound. And this gives a substantially, uh, 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 yeah, gives a somewhat smaller bound on the total rank of the gauge group. And this is once again, the rank of the gauge group as probed by a um, string intersecting the totality of seven brains um, with this intersection. So um, depending on how much time I have, let me, uh, quickly give an argument why, why we believe that um, in this particular example, um, in fact, only um, a, a smaller number of chiral multiples actually contributes to the bound, which sharpens the bound. Circle. Why is this? Just very briefly, the argument comes by um, looking at the dual M theory realization. So we really need to know now what these strings are. Namely, these strings we can also get in the dual M theory picture by taking the five brain and wrapping it on the four cycle on the color BO4 pole. The full cycle is obtained, uh, is obtained by uh, taking the elliptic vibration over this curve on the base. This gives a string, the famous um, um, MSW string. In six dimensions, this would be called MSW string. In four dimensions, it's precisely the EFT string we are discussing here. And there we can um, discuss the type of master spectrum. Um, now, by, reduct, by reducing the, um, the field content on the M5 brain, which is given by itself to a two form, complex scalars again and fermionic partners. And the result is. Um, the following, the um, reduction of the chiral two form gives rise to these uh, particular um, uh, scalars of the second type, which we believe do contribute to the uh, rank on the gauge group. The reason is that in particular, the left moving of these scalars are precisely counted by H11. And if you know a little bit about F theory, you know that H11 is precisely what is sensitive to the gauge group 
um, uh, in F theory, because if you reduce the three form of M theory with respect to H11, then you get um, the ones that um, are the U ones of the seven brain case. So this microscopic picture explains why only um, a, set, a certain set, excuse me, um, of, these, uh, of these scalars actually contributes, and this is what allows us to sharpen them. Okay, so um, this was now from the string point of view. We have a certain bound. I, I, I showed again, this is our claim for the bound on the rank of the gate group in F theory. And um, it's now clear that we need to um, compare this to what we know from geometry or what we think to know from geometry and see how it behaves if we learn new things. And um, also, uh, uh, um, if we can understand uh, the claims that are made about the distinction between these two um, uh, types of types of moduli in a better way. So um, uh, let's first look at um, F theory with non abelian gauge algebra. As um, you all know, in F theory, if we want to have a non abelian gauge algebra on a certain device, then this means that you need to um, make your elliptic vibration singular in a certain way over that device, which is read by the seven brain. This is technically encoded in the vanishing orders of the discriminant over that device. And that is the content of the infamous uh, Kodaira table. And from this table, it's, my thumbs are just too thick for this. Um, from this. From this table, you can see, you can observe that the rank of the gauge group on a certain stack of seven brains is always smaller or equal to the order of vanishing of this discriminant along this device. So this is, gives rise to the so-called Kodaira bound. Um, just by this trivial kind of observation, we know that the rank of the gauge group for the non-abelian part must be constrained in a certain way. And um, now let's um, turn this into a bound. The bound would be, this is the Kodaira bound that was discussed, for example, by Morrison and Taylor in their paper. Um, but uh, let's take some, some curve which intersects every stack of seven brains, so which is in the interior of the movable cone. Then the total non-abelian rank in this theory can be um, uh, bounded uh, by this expression. So clearly, since the curve intersects every device with at least one, this equation is true. If I sums over all non-abelian gauge groups, and um, this by itself is smaller or equal than the uh, um, intersection of this curve with the, um, with the total discriminant locus, so the totality of all seven. Um, this is the geometric bound. If we compare it to our bound, it compares well. So our bound is just a little bit stronger by minus two. So you would say, what the heck? Why, why um, um, do all this if all we get is a lousy minus two out of it? There are two reasons. First, the Kodaira bound is sensitive only to the non-abelian part of the gauge group, but we want the actual full rank, including abelian gauge fields, and the geometry cannot tell us anything about that in that simple way. And second, as I said, we have a stronger bound. This bound has five over six versus just one from the geometry, and this is not obvious from the from the geometry, and we believe that this is actually the bound um, um, that should be that should be used. Okay, um, let's go through some examples. How much more? Seven minutes, perfect. Seven minutes for two examples. So example one, this is a very simple example because in this example, the EFT string is guaranteed to talk to every type of seven brain that we have. Why? Because we are looking at an example where the base of our elliptic vibration has just one Keller modulus. Um, so um, the, uh, only, there's only one type of curve therefore also, which is given by the, this class is the self-intersection. Um, of, of this hyperplane class, of this divisor class. So therefore, um, if we have seven brains, they must all be homologous to each other. There's only one type of curve. It will intersect every seven brain, and therefore it will be sensitive to all to the totality of the gate. So we can now apply the previous formulae and uh, deduce the maximal rank that we would get. And our strict rank, in fact, um, gives uh, 38. Um, the generic rank, which is the one that we can derive bottom up, but for which we have an explanation only in F theory um, or wherever we look uh, more closely from a bottom up perspective, this would give uh, 46. And then the naive bound, this is in fact the one that we believe for some time to be true, um, um, is uh, the one where we only take into account the contribution from the localized fermions and forget about these charged uh, scalars. This would be smaller. And now let's compare this to what actually is going on in the geometry. I mean, this is a very simple, uh, simple geometry. So for, for instance, if we look at the maximal rank of the SUN gauge groups that one can get, 
Um, this was shown to be uh, maximal rank 31, which compares, compares well with this um, uh, naive bound, where it ignores the contribution from the chiral multiplets. But in fact, this bound can easily be, um, uh, can, can easily be uh, violated. And in fact, we believe that the strict bound here, the 38, indeed is the correct bound. And so far, we have not found any country. And the second example, and this will be an educational example because we will understand in this way better what's really going on, is an example where we take our base to be a, a P1 vibration or rational vibration over a surface. Um, so in other words, this is the base of our, our elliptic vibration in F theory. We have a P1 fiber over a two surface. And all we need to know is that um, the movable curves include certain movable cu curves from the base. Sorry, same problem. And, and the fiber. So this P1 fiber is movable. You can see it with your eye that it's movable because you can move the fiber everywhere over, uh, over this geometry. So this is certainly a movable, movable curve. So let's look at the string obtained by wrapping the D3 brain on this movable curve, the fiber F. This string is the famous heterotic string. So the D3 brain on this P1 fiber is the heterotic string which defines the dual heterotic compactification given by fibering an elliptic fiber now over the same base. And um, in this way, we can give it's an, an easy, a simple interpretation to the various types of states uh, uh, of, of masses modes of the string. The chiral modes of the first type, these were counted by um, this intersection number two. So two complex fields, these are four real moduli. So we've got four real moduli, which are associated with the motion of this a movable curve over the base B2. And these are one to one to the four real moduli of the heterotic string probing um, the, uh, uh, the dual color uh, uh, or the part um, responsible for the motion of the dual heterotic string on this, uh, on this base. But the second type of uh, chiral moduli, there's only one complex, many of them. This corresponds to the two real moduli of the heterotic string along the T2 fiber. There are no charged Fermi multiplets. So this explains why the, um, only the second type of moduli can possibly contribute to um, uh, um, the uh, gauge rank. Um, namely, the first type of moduli, um, this is just a geometric modulus of the hydraulic string. And we would not expect this to be gauged under the um, um, actual gauge group. Whereas the two actual real moduli of the hydraulic string along the two fiber, they can be gauged in the following sense. They can admit a gauge shift in it. So if we take um, this uh, second type of, uh, um, of moduli into account, we would get as our rank on the gauge group 18. And this 18 can in fact be realized. So we can, for instance, get a rank 18 gauge group um, as a, a product of six uh, copy, um, copy uh, three copies of six. Um, um, so, so that uh, this, uh, this bound that we propose uh, can indeed be, um, can indeed be um, uh, be, be, be saturated. And in order to do this, just as a technicality, one has to um, choose the base in a very special way. To, uh, one has to take it to be a, a rational elliptic surface, and this will become on the next slide. Namely, I want to interpret this 18. The 18 from the heterotic point of view is a 16 from E8 on Z8, plus two more. And these two more are the two Kalusa Klein ones along the elliptic fiber of the heterotic. Um, of the heterotic um, um, compactification. Um, you will think that this is um, not very sensible because uh, heterotic, um, uh, if, uh, if, if the elliptic vibration is non-trivial, then there should not be a KKU1. And indeed, I agree. So for this uh, to actually to, to arise, the um, dual heterotic geometry should be degenerated, should be sitting at an orbifold point, And the type of manifold um, that is dual indeed can have that problem. So we propose that um, the um, uh, role of these extra um, chiral fields in this case is um, to, to, to give a contribution to the gauge group from what is a KK um, U1 in the dual heterotic picture. And um, if one goes to higher supersymmetric cases, one indeed recovers in this way um, uh, for more KK U1s from the base, uh, which gives back this 22 that was discussed already. Okay, let me just um, <clears throat> make one last, one last comment. Um, in order to get a universal bound um, on the rank, we need to find a curve which intersects every seven brain in our compactification. 
In general, this is hard. That's why we are not able to give a general number, an actual number for the rank. But for abelian U1s, it turns out that we only need to find a curve which um, has positive intersection number with um, the anti-canonical um, class of the um, um, of the of the of the um, um, F theory base. This is because um, in this case, the type of seven brain, so to speak, that one has to consider are of a very special form. And if then furthermore, we restrict to six dimensions, so compatification elliptic threefolds, we in fact can classify these curves. Namely, the um, um, basis of elliptic Calabria threefolds, compactification six dimensions, can be only one of two types. It could either be a P2 or it can be the blow up of a um, rational vibration. And in both cases, we can evaluate this number and therefore give an explicit bound on the possible number of U1s. This is the number. We can have at most 28 non Cartan U1s in six dimensional compactifications of F. And um, if, you, uh, if you may remember, this is the same as claiming that elliptic Calabria threefolds have a model Y group of a certain bounded rank because extra sections are equivalent to extra U1s in F theory. So the number of sections, i.e., the rank of the model Y group, is bounded by the number of U1s. And this, in fact, is a prediction for mathematics because in mathematics it is not known what is the maximum possible rank of model Y group for elliptic threefolds. It's an um, open question in arithmetic geometry. And uh, these arguments um, make a prediction from physics it can be at best 28. So um, let's make a reality check what is known about possible values. So, what is the highest current um, uh, number? The highest current number is 10. This appeared in a paper with Antonella Grassi. Um, last year, these are the so-called Schill manifolds of Namikawa type, and um, these are the, the current record holders, so to speak, for the number of rational sections. But of course, it will be interesting to uh, see uh, um, what more can be said from an arithmetic po um, uh, point of view. And it's amusing that uh, these quantum gravity considerations um, make a proposal from, um, from physics. Okay, let me wrap up. Um, I've applied um, a general bottom-up bounds on the rank of the gauge group in 4D n equal 1 supergravities to F theory concretely. This has led to a novel sharpened bound on the rank um, uh, in terms of certain geometric quantities, which is stronger than known geometric bounds, the Kudaira bounds, which applies also to abelian and non-abelian gauge groups, and which matches expectations also from the dual heterotic strings, but it's more general. There are many open questions. First, um, um, I uh, went quickly over some certain assumptions about uncharged Fermi multiples, which I'm happy to spell out. And uh, we have a conjecture why uh, this is in fact uh, uh, the, the correct thing to do. Um, uh, this has to do with uh, properties of the generators of the movable cone, but this is certainly something that would be interesting to understand better. And the big goal I think is to translate um, um, this or other considerations into universal bounds for the rank of the gauge group. I think this is one of the dreams of the field to give actual bounds um, or on, on the matter content. Um, and in this case, for example, on the rank of gauge group in all 4D n equal one theories. Um, and as I said, this uh, requires um, um, more work, but um, I hope this whole program also taking into account six and five dimensional uh, previous papers, of course, um, can, can, can uh, lead the way. And finally, we'd also like to know about matter in six dimensions. Um, um, uh, Tazari and Waffa have made interesting statements in this paper, and it would be very interesting to see how this um, boils then down, or how, how this works out in theories with four supercharges in four dimensions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Any question? Okay, Thomas has one there. Uh, thanks, Timo. Um, I have a question. So we know in fourfold compactifications of F theory that also U ones come from the two comma one forms. That's right. Yes. Uh, did you think about this? Yes. Because yes, yes, yes. Very good. So um, that's why I was I was careful here to say about, um, make statements about six dimensions. Indeed, in in uh, for the two comma two comma one um, in for, for these types of U ones, uh, one has to look at the different sector of strings. I mean the complex structure strings. Mm -hmm. These are, um, as you know, uh, their moduli are um, constrained or described by, in, by the complex structure sector, uh, uh, sector of the fourfold. So one would have to understand the complex structure strings in this EF, EFT string. And from a dual point of view, these uh, would presume, I mean, if one has a hydraulic dual, one could think about 
and pipe brains on, on higher genius curves and the associated EFT strings there. So um, we, we haven't um, looked at this in detail because finding those strings is difficult. As you know, on the complex structure side, one doesn't know where these strings really come from in such a and, uh, clear way. And I would also claim that this picture of this cone, which is uh, which also Luca showed, that this is not correct for other limits which are not in the scalar sector. Uh, why that? I, we can discuss off uh, offline, but but I think the it's more complicated than this in the complex structures. That's right. Yes, it, it's certainly. So it's it, it, you, it's not easy to single out directions which have no instant on correction so easily. It's just in the large complex structure limit you can do that, but in other limits there can be non-trivial direction which have a, an instant on factor in front of everything which is not important. Right. So from from the mirror from mirror symmetry perspective, um, I mean under mirror symmetry this maps to this maps to type two type two a. Um, if if we stay for example in the four D n equal two context, and there of course we know what the strings are, and, the, and the, of course there are corrections, but there are certain cases there are certain cases which are very well understood already in type two a, even though one has no clue what's going on in complex structures. Are. And this makes me very confident that it's more something that we don't understand yet. But um, yes. that would be my Suspicion. Okay, uh, Dieter has a question, and then I think we have an online question. Thanks, Timo. This is a kind of an FCO lamp post uh, question. Namely, as you and as Lucas have nicely explained, there is a bottom up uh, bound, and there is this F series bound. The F series bound apparently is, uh, is sharper, is more strict. Are you aware of any other string constructions which saturate the? Uh, Less strict bound from bottom up, but violates the F theory bound. But violate the F theory bound? Yes, uh, but uh, it's still in accordance with the bo bottom up bound. Um, so, so okay. Um, I think the the this is something which I didn't explain well because I kind kind of started rushing. I apologize. Mm -hmm. the, the the point is the, uh, the this assumption on the sharpening of the bound. This came by making one more assumption, which I should have stressed more. Namely, the assumption is that we really have maximal, uh, minimal supersymmetry, and that we are in a regime where there are no singularities on our on, on our geometry. So uh, this was in order to exclude extra Kaluza client contributions. Um, if we increase the number of supersymmetry, then we also get more um, more Kaluza client ones, for example, and this is what's responsible for uh, for this higher number there. So um, I think. It, um, for, for instance, if the, and the answer therefore is if I take, for instance, a heterotic orbifold to 4D n equal one, this can have rank up to 22 in 4D n equal one. Um, but um, the reason is not that it's heterotic versus F theory, the reason is that it's not, not on a smooth space, which was one of the assumptions which I should have made clear. So um, uh, this specialization here is for a particular sm for, for, for smooth geometry. Um, the strict bound. The actual bound is this 22 bound, and this can also be realized in 4D n equal one, say, head radical, as an example. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we read the 